Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining me from. Um, thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to be with us uh, to uh, um, to listen to this webinar on increasing the value of your test process. My name is Magdi Hanna. I am the host of this webinar. I'm very grateful to have with me today Robin Goldsmith, one truly one of the leaders in software quality and test management and software engineering in general. Um, Robin Goldsmith has been in the field for uh, as long as I have been in the field and I'm sure much longer because when I entered the field uh, more than 35 years ago, um, Robin was already an, a known recognized expert in his field. I'm very grateful that he's with us today to share his experience with us on um, what he's been doing with test process and and how to improve the, the value and increase the value of your test process. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to give the microphone to, uh, to Robin to start his webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Testing Institute website um, sometime early next week. Uh, Robin, please go ahead. Thank you, Magdi. Welcome, everybody. Uh, back of uh, statements about me, who I am, you can read this. I'm not going to read it to you except to tell you that once upon a time I did honest work as a developer and systems programmer and project leader and uh, continue to do that uh, in my own consulting and training practices. Um, I've been fortunate to be a member of several uh, IEEE standards uh, working groups, uh, uh, most currently on 41062, which is significantly revising the software acquisition standard. And um, it's been very uh, uh, interesting and rewarding. Uh, been around a, a bit, uh, certainly not as old as Magdi suggests. Uh, I'm only 24 years old, but do have more than 30 years of experience in spite of that. Okay do have a book uh, called Discovering Real Business Requirements for Software Project Success. And uh, forthcoming book on writing, write agile user stories and acceptance tests. And I want you to be aware that uh, this, uh, this webinar is sort of a preview for a full day class called Managing the Test Process, a Proactive Approach, scheduled for Monday, September 27th. And that's one of four courses that we'll be presenting that week. And I encourage you to uh, consider them. And if you eat each of these courses from IIST, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, is related to uh, certifications. Each course at the end of the, the day, you take a uh, 15 to 30 minute um, uh, cert exam to confirm that you've uh, uh, understood the material. And um, if you take and pass the exams for a number of courses, you get, in this instance, the Certified Software Test Lead Certification. Okay. And if you're only interested, if you're not interested in the certification, I will encourage you to consider taking some of these courses. Anyhow, the courses in September will be presented live, so you get the advantage of interacting uh, during the course. Um, but if you'd prefer to take classes on demand, we have a no number of my courses are available, along with ones from Magdi and other instructors. And um, four of them that are available online as recordings are, are the ones that qualify for the CSTL. Plus, you know, I do a lot of work with organizations on site and these days remotely. Uh, 
both with regard to QA and testing and requirements and management. So if I can be of assistance to you, that's what I endeavor to do. So if you would, please um, put into the chat, I think my slides say put into the Q&A, but really put it into the chat because that's uh, uh, what apparently we're seeing these days. Um, if you would, please share with me um, what your purposes are in attending today, um, any issues that you've got, objectives that you've got, anything that you hope that uh, we'll address in this uh, training, and I'll, I'll do my best either to address it today or uh, you know, give you some alternative ways to uh, uh, address it. So if you would, uh, let me uh, interject here, uh, Robin. I don't know if the chat tab is available to the audience, but I'm ah. sure the questions tab is. So please okay, go so if, and click on the questions tab and write uh, your comments there. Okay, Sorry. so Magdi, you, if you can see the questions tab, yes, I do. Please, uh, please read me what people say because I don't have a questions tab. Okay, I will do. I will do. This is one of, one of the oddities of the uh, online presentation world, is that uh, the <coughs> presenter doesn't always see the same things as the attendees. So, so far, uh, no thoughts yet. Okay. Well, hope hopefully uh, there are reasons for you to be attending. Uh, hopefully, there are things that you're hoping to get from this. Uh, if you don't share them with me. I'm going to be at somewhat of a disadvantage, but I'm going to continue on. So let me share with you what I see as the objectives for today. So first of all, we want you to be able to identify your real testing process and why managing it matters. Okay. And we'll look further into what we mean by the real testing process in, in a few minutes. We want you to be able to recognize some keys that, to improving the value that your testing produces and get some ideas on how to make it work in agile projects, even ones where your organization may no longer have people who are identified as testers. So um, if you would, once again, put in the, the questions box, um, can you define your testing process? Now, it may not be defined formally, but I think that you will find that if you think back in your organization, there are things that people tend to do related to testing that it may not be explicit, it may not be formal, but that there indeed are th things that you would say, this is how we do testing. Okay. And I'm if you a, would, please share those. I want to confirm uh, to this minute, uh, no one shared anything yet. No one sharing anything yet. Yes. So uh, so we'll give another, another minute for that because uh, this is going to be uh, an important starting point uh, for analyzing what we do, uh, and uh, this helps us uh, understand where you're coming from, but more importantly, it's going to help you understand where you're coming from. And one of the, one of the things that we find is that simply the act of capturing a description of what your testing process is, is an important step in getting more value out of it. So any, uh, any thoughts there? Okay. Uh, Not yet. Okay, Magdi, do you want to share a couple of elements that you would consider to be part of a testing process? At least what I've seen uh, working with organizations, 
um, typical um, typical organizations would have a test process that includes elements such as uh, looking at the requirements or the user stories, um, sometimes with the developers, sometimes without the developers. Uh, then, so just to verifying them, making sure that you don't have any further questions. Then uh, going in and writing what I've seen people doing, they call them test scripts. Although I couldn't tell sometimes if they are really test cases, are they really steps of the tests? But it's document that tells them what to test to what not. Uh, and uh, of course that document has expected results or expected behavior. Uh, and then the last part of the process normally is a test execution, which is sometimes is manual or automated. This is very much the skeleton of most of the test processes I've seen uh, with organizations. Uh, now I see um, Kaylee shared something with us. Uh, she said our best practices is to write functional test cases before development begins, which I, I think is a great idea. Um, both developers and the QA should run through these tests. And she says it does not always happen though. Okay. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna capture uh, uh, what Magdi was saying there. I should have been capturing it as he was saying it. So very quick reviewing the requirements uh, and or user stories, um, writing test cases, then executing them. Okay, uh, so look at requirements, uh, clarify, uh, 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 write test scripts, uh, expected behaviors, and results, and uh, execute. And and can you repeat what uh, Kaylee said there? Um, said um, the right then the the right what they call functional test cases before development begins, and they both developers and the QA should run through these tests, which does not happen all the time. Dev and QA run through these? Yes. And I think it's remarkable what Kaylee is saying that if really an organization can always make sure that tests are written before developers, although I, I know how difficult that could be because developers are not going to wait for you uh, to write test cases. But that's why we suggest that the version of the test cases you write before development start would be a much lighter version than the, the full-blown test cases. Uh, absolutely, I've never right. succeeded to get developers to wait for QA to write their test cases. Okay, well, excellent. Thank you, Kaylee, for your contributions. Any others? No, nope, not so far. Okay. So, so now we've got a testing process, okay? And if you would, uh, can you identify in the, in the questions what test process management means to you and your organization, in, if in fact you even use that kind of a term, and how it differs from managing and conducting the testing itself, if in fact it does. So, you know, we're putting a, a big burden on uh, uh, you attendees, but uh, you, I think once again, you're gonna find that you get more out of this, the more that you think about these things and how they pertain to your own world. And uh, so if, uh, if we get any thoughts on what uh, uh, test process management means, uh, we'll once again capture that uh, as best I can. Okay. Any any uh, 
contributions there? No, not to this minute. Okay. So, uh, Magdi, in your experience, do you find that many people make a distinction between managing the test process and managing the test execution? I, I'm going to have to say no. I mean, I've never talked to any people, um, any organization that you've seen the term. I know, I know this term is important, Robin, but people do not understand what it means to manage the test process. Uh, you and I know what it involves, but people are struggling, as you saw now, struggling just defining their their practices. I'm not going to even use the word the process. Um, they, they're, they're struggling to define their practices in testing. And if you ask two members of the same t team about what are your practices, you're going to get two different answers. It's state of practice is really poor. Let's put it this way. I'm sure you're aware of that, Robin. I'm not going to. Well, a big surprise to everybody, right? <laughs> okay. okay. So one other, one other thing that I'll ask you to uh, think about, you know, what are the strengths, the weaknesses, and the issues in your organization's current management of your test process? So if, if you've got any strengths to the way that you do testing now, uh, let us know in the, in the Q&A, in the questions box. Uh, if, if there are weaknesses or issues with the way that you're managing your testing, uh, please give us an indication. Okay. Once again, I'll... Capture here if I can. Any, any strengths? So, I, Magdi, I, I, once again. Yeah, I will talk only when you invite me, Robin. <laughs> I will talk. Yeah, you, yeah uh, if we're not getting any in the questions box, Magdi, why don't you? share one or two strengths of test processes that that you've seen well i i couldn't think of any better strength than what kaylee shared with us earlier in the previous note that developing test cases or writing test cases or writing some form of tests before development starts i always tell people to not necessarily to write the full-blown test case document but at least come up with scenarios. So coming up with what you'd call them test scenarios or scenarios or in, in blunt in, in very simple terms, what is it that you want to test, but both positive and negative? What is it that you expect the system to do in, in the form of a scenario, in the form of a test case, in the form of whatever you want to call it? Something that developers can see before they start. The key here is before starting a development. That's a big strength to me. If I see this in an organization, and Kaylee, I should really um, commend your, your organization for doing that. Um, the, the second practice, the second strength is, again, what Kaylee said, is that developers are reviewing those test cases with QA, uh, although she said that does not happen very often. Uh, but these are the most important strengths I would like to see. I have not seen them before. I'm hearing it from Kaylee now as a first, uh, first time. Great. No. What about weaknesses in, in managing test processes, Magda? Any thoughts on that? Um, there are so many weaknesses that are already there in uh, in uh, among the tested teams. I can I can share this, things like uh, um, no enough people to test, no not enough time to test. I should say not enough time to test. Uh, um, not uh, not a good requirement. No, no, not not a good enough requirements re available. And any other issues? Uh, I have to be honest with you. I'm 
I'm trying to understand the, the difference between a weakness and an issue. Uh, an issue to me, again, means that management do not understand the value of testing. Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. I, I, believe, I, I agree with you in general. Sometimes people think differently when you say issue than when you say weakness. So, but but Kelly, okay. Kelly, Kelly shared something here about weaknesses uh, and also issues. She said weakness is not consistent. Several different. Okay, I'll let you uh, capture the 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 issue that you're trying to capture, uh, Rob. And um, management do not appreciate or understand the value of testing. And management doesn't appreciate the value of, of testing? Test. Yes. All right. Okay, uh, anything else that Kaylee? Um, uh, yeah, Kaylee said, um, uh, by the way, this last one is not from Kaylee. I have to be careful here. That's on, that's mine because we okay. don't want to get Kaylee in trouble here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so Kelly says it's not consistent and you already captured that. Um, sometimes I'm hoping uh, to develop, um, I'm hoping to develop, forgive me. It's actually something, uh, oh, let me, let me. Weakness, okay. Not consistent, several different systems and it's a lot of business knowledge to transfer across teams. So as a weakness, she says, a lot of um, business knowledge to transfer across teams. I I'm gonna assume this, this is more a, of an issue rather than weakness. Uh, okay. And, but she also listed some issues here, she says, not always enough time to prioritize testing or documentation. Another issue is scope creep, of course. Of course, scope creep causes inaccurate requirements or documentation. Okay. Okay, good. So, well, Got a good start there. So, um, so we're we're we've used this term testing process, and we need to understand what a process is and why we care what a process is. So not what the testing process is, but just what a process is, is in general. And uh, so I'm, rather than uh, imposing on uh, Kaylee and the others good graces here, let me suggest a common definition. A set of steps or actions that should be taken to achieve a desired result. So when I ask this to people, the, this is pretty much the definition that most people give. And I want you to understand that part of our difficulty managing processes relates to our difficulty understanding what a process is. Because this common definition, which is widely held, actually leads us into trouble. So, a process is not just actions or steps. It's also beliefs and customs and management practices and skills and knowledge that together produce a result. And the process exists whether or not it is recognized whether or not it is intended, whether or not it is even desirable. Okay. Now, the reason why it's important to understand what your process is, is because it enables you to predict your results. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the, uh, the definition of insanity attributed to Albert Einstein, 
doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Because if you do the same thing over again, you are going to get basically the same results. So if you know what your process is and you repeat it, then you are going to get basically the same results. And another way to look at that is that that enables us to predict our results. Now, this gets complicated because there are two types of processes. There is the real process that's actually producing our results, and often the real process is not recognized. And then there is the presumed process, what people think is producing your results. Now, sometimes the presumed process uh, is a defined process. In fact, most of the time, the presumed process is a defined process. A defined process is one that multiple people know, often because it is documented, but there are many defined processes that are not documented. So for instance, if um, I hold the door open for you, you say thank you. That is part of the defined process. But there's no sign up that says say thank you if somebody holds the door open for you. So it's a defined process, but not a documented process. Now, the significance of this is that if you want to change your results, you need to change your process. But which process are people likely to change? The real process they may not even be aware of, or the presumed process that they think is producing their results. And so people are going to change the process that they think is producing their results. If in fact the presumed process is different from the real process, if in fact the presumed process is not producing their current results, changing the presumed process that's not producing our current results is probably not going to have any effect on the result, certainly not a desired effect. So if we are going to have meaningful change, we need to change the real process. And in order to change the real process, first we have to recognize what it is. And that's hard because people often don't have much consciousness or awareness of what's really happening. Now, in the process world, there are a couple of common terms. One of them is the as-is or current state process. The as-is process is the process that is currently producing our results. And we want to change to what's called the should be process or the future state process. That's the process that will presumably produce the desired changed results. That's what requirements represent. Requirements represent what it is that we will uh, will presumably produce our desired results. And this gets complicated because people often look at processes uh, in a partial manner. This is often referred to as silo thinking. And so if you're familiar with silos in a, uh, on a farm, you know, a silo is a tall, typically cylindrical structure that is used for storing food for animals. Uh, if you were inside of a silo, your view of the world would be very narrow. There might be a little window up at the top of the silo, 
but that would not enable you to see very much about what was going on outside of the silo. You wouldn't be able to know, for instance, that there was a silo next to you and somebody else was in that with their own silo view. You might see a view of the sky, but it might not be a, an accurate view because it's only a small slice. And so silo views, partial views of the, the real process can create presumptions that turn out to be different from the real process. So when we are going to understand and evaluate and analyze and improve our process, we need to understand the process, the full process, from its beginning to the full end result. Now, let's put this in the context of software development. I'm sure many of you are familiar with projects that have some coding and then some testing, and then they come to the stop sign, the deadline. Okay. And I bet you're also familiar with projects where the coding takes longer than it was scheduled. Okay. Now, if the amount of testing is somehow proportional to the amount of coding, if the amount of testing that's needed is somehow proportional to the amount of coding, if there is more coding than we expected, then there ought to be more testing than is expected. But what doesn't change? It's the stop sign, the deadline, okay? And so what happens? The testing tends to get squeezed and we end up reliably and repeatedly delivering trouble. Now, if you were to go to anybody in your organization and ask them to describe your software development and testing process, I think it is highly unlikely that anybody would say, well, we schedule the coding and testing to be done by the deadline. We blow the coding, we squeeze the testing, and we deliver trouble. Nobody would say that, and yet that is what's really happening. But instead, people keep acting as if this presumed process of code test done is happening, and it's not. So. Anybody can deliver by a deadline if it doesn't matter what they deliver. And what we need to realize is the way that most software development occurs, the software development from the beginning to the deadline is in a silo. And most software organizations don't relate the trouble that they get to what they did that produced the trouble. Instead, they just keep denying and keep doing what they've been doing and getting the same bad results and expecting better results, and that's insanity. So if we're going to get better, and by the way, if you look at organizations that are good at what they do, and this is typically not in the information systems world, but if you look at organizations that are good at what they do, they understand that if they've got difficulties, they need to go back and identify what's causing them and change the source of their difficulties. Okay? And we need to understand that we're not done until things work right. And typically, in the software world, that's after they've worked wrong and they have to be fixed. Okay. And just repeating that process rather than understanding it and improving, fixing it and improving it continues to give us the same bad results. So if we think back to our testing process that you said a few minutes ago, Oops, here we go. So let's see, uh, please, please put into the Q&A uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, can you think of anything that happens in the real process that is different from what this defined process says? Can you think of anything that really happens that's different? Uh, okay, and while, while we're hoping to get some contributions from our attendees, Magdi, can you think of anything that uh, uh, happens uh, that in addition to or different from this or this is not done? I'll just add one yeah. thing that uh, Ke Kelly said there. You don't always do it, right? Okay. What else? Magda, anything else there that you can share? Developers are normally not involved uh, in the in the review of the test cases. Okay. Um, and another Any thing I used, to, I used to hear all the time that that um, um, QA is not um, is not very active in reviewing the requirements, which is okay. and I'm assuming you're you're looking for a deviation from this process. Yep. What really happens? Okay. 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 Just add a few additional ones here while you're thinking of things. Okay, what else? What else? Okay. Okay. So we're executing the tests, right? Okay. So we get defects, fix, retest, again. Okay, go into production, defects, fix, test, okay, and uh, a lot of what we find is uh, wrong and missing requirements, okay, and so forth and so forth. Does this sound familiar? I think most Agile people, most people working on Agile projects will always complain from the fact that the test environment is not stable. Developers inject code there, um, which makes retesting is difficult because you run test cases yesterday, you get results, you run them today, you get different results. Okay, good point. So what have we got here? We've got stuff in the red and stuff in the black. Together, that represents the real process. If we think only in terms of the stuff in black and we're oblivious to the stuff in red, then we shouldn't be surprised that our test process doesn't work very well. So understanding the difference between the real and the presumed testing process, focusing on the real testing process is important. Now, a process determines how we do projects. And the way that we demonstrate or understand the process is to accumulate measures across projects. So if every project turns out to produce 50 defects, we can say that our real process is producing 50 defects per project. 
Okay. Now, when we're understanding what's going on, we actually need to look at two separate things, separate but related things. We need to look at the results that we're getting. So you know, how much code is working code is being delivered, how well is it working, how how you know what's it accomplishing, what's it not accomplishing. But we also need to be identifying what were the actions, the beliefs, the customs, in other words, the real process that was producing those results. Because in order to get different results, we need to understand what our process was, what it was producing, and why, and how we might then change that process to improve it. Okay, and so part of what we need to understand is what is the value of our testing process? What value does it provide? What value could it or should it provide? Okay, the difference between those two represents beneficial improvements. So if you if you can think of anything uh, that would be valuable to improve in your organization's testing process and or the management of your testing process, please put that into the, the Q&A and uh, we'll give a, a few seconds for that and then we'll let you chime in, Magdi, if, if you'd like. So um, while people are entering, hopefully in the in the questions box, uh, Magdi, uh, any thoughts uh, on things that might be beneficial improvements uh, to make in people's testing processes or the management of it? I'm sorry, I was um, I was muted. Um, I was talking to myself here. Uh, yeah, if management, if management can um, make sure that all members of the tested team really understand how to come up with good test cases, uh, we, we always remember that um, your your product, your your release is only as good as the test cases. What I found out that. We got a test team of 10 people, seven people, eight people. One or two of them really knows how to write good test cases, and the rest do not. I mean, this is a fact. This is a fact. We know it, and I think we're not willing to admit it because we don't want to admit weaknesses in, in our people. But management need to do whatever it takes to make sure that everyone is on the same page about what it, what 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 a good test case is uh, it's it's all about education it's educating the team how to write good test cases uh, positive and and negative uh, and i i put management here I, I put this as a responsibility of management because um, teams cannot do anything about it uh, but teams think that they know what they're doing uh, but but the truth is that what i've seen is that a lot of team members many team members do not know how to write good test cases, and I'm yeah, sure. But I, I would suggest that the starting point is management's not going to have any input to that because management doesn't have a clue. Yeah, well, educating at least, at least, um, at least a sponsor an, an an educational process. Sponsor an educational process. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that management to will educate themselves. Because will educate the team because they, you're right. They don't know. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, but if management understand the value of what it means to write good test cases, how to address both positive and negative tests, how do you make sure your tests are complete? Uh, again, bad tests will only produce bad releases. Uh, okay, good. Any any additional thoughts? Anything in the Q and A in the questions? Uh, 
have one here from Kaylee again, uh, improve test script templates so that it is easier to create new test cases. Okay. And give more time for QA to do estimates. So improve templates and give more time for estimates. More time for test estimates. Okay, good. Great, thank you. Thank you. So, got some ideas there. And uh, once again, this is um, um, uh, for, for your own organization. So, your, your mileage may vary. Now, somebody's going to say, oh, but we're agile and we're different. Okay. And so the good news is that in Agile, it's very common for testing to be integrated with development. And so in fact, many Agile teams actually pay more attention to testing than their prior teams. Some of that comes with test first unit testing. Some of it comes with user story acceptance testing. But the, the downside is that very often testing has lost its identity. It's just getting merged into the cross-functional agile team. And in fact, increasingly I'm seeing that there are organizations, more and more organizations that have simply done away with the concept of a testing specialist and that this premise that testing is everybody's job and that it's really a development uh, activity uh, on the one hand uh, uh, it's always been development's job that hasn't changed but the problem is that when you remove people with a testing specialization you tend to remove uh, the benefit of greater understanding and greater awareness, okay? And uh, uh, getting back to what uh, you were saying a few minutes ago, you know, how are the tests chosen? How good are they, okay? And one of the difficulties with test-first development is that, even though a developer is writing a test before they write their executable code, what they're really usually doing is just testing what they've already coded in their head. They're not really thinking testing, they're thinking coding. And so the tests that they end up with are often very superficial, lack suitable depth, Okay, uh, typically have a positive test and one or no negative tests. And in general, we know that you usually need many more negative tests than positive tests. And we find that Agile's attention to developing small pieces of executable code where Agile, even, even the Agile uh, zealots often recognize that where Agile gets into trouble is when you try and integrate the pieces. So the, the pieces of executable code, the units tend to be pretty good, but then the difficulties occur when you try to put those units together. And overarching all of this is that there's very seldom, at least in my experience, anybody who's actually monitoring what's going on. And so the, uh, uh, the post-implementation re reviews, the, the retrospectives tend not to be very insightful. Okay? And there's just no overview of, pardon the expression, the testing process. So just to quickly introduce you to an important definition, what we mean by managing the testing process is to define how you appropriately determine 
what must be demonstrated to be confident that it works, how to demonstrate it, and how to capture, report, and address those results of demonstrating it. That's what testing is. And then making that the real process that's actually used. So a lot of people define ideal testing processes, but they never make them happen. Okay. And that you need to then monitor and measure each testing project's results and the causes of those results, identify when things are happening that are different from what you desire, reevaluate and adjust, change the process, the actions, the beliefs, the customs to improve your practices, enhance strengths and overcome weaknesses. So you can get improvements by enhancing strengths as well as by overcoming weaknesses and recognize that this is like shampoo. You repeat, this is never ending. You repeat steps two to six. Okay, That's what we mean by managing the testing process. Okay, and could your process be improved? And if it were improved, would there be benefits? What are some things you might do to do it? What kind of obstacles might you encounter? So I would suggest that we're a resource to help you, uh, whether you're uh, you know, attending webinars like this, whether you're uh, attending the seminars that are upcoming, getting uh, certifications, having us come directly to you, either uh, in person or virtually. Okay, We've got all of these ways that we can help you, and that's why we're here. We want you to be able to become more effective. So hopefully you've seen some ideas about what your real testing process is and why understanding what your real testing process is matters and why managing your real testing process matters. You've seen some keys to improving the value that your testing produces, okay, which gets back to making your process work more effectively. And making it work in agile projects, even ones without testers. So even if you've got an agile team where nobody has the designated role of tester, and that's fine, you still need to have people in those teams, and it doesn't have to be just one individual but you have to have at least one individual who is taking a testing mindset approach, thinking in terms of testing, thinking in terms of the testing process, as well as the testing practices that the testing process produces. By the way, uh, another week from now, we've got another free webinar, Managing Testing Beyond the Test Management Tool. A lot of people think that if you just use a tool that that answers all your problems. Guess what? It doesn't. Uh, you didn't build the Empire State Building by giving out hammers to more people. Okay. So going to be looking at this in a different way, but uh, hopefully you'll find that valuable as well. Remind you that managing the test process, a proactive approach, live in uh, online full day seminar on Monday, September 27th, okay? Help you uh, take some of the ideas that we've been discussing today and take them considerably further and give you considerably additional assistance with this. Remember that that's one of four courses that together uh, if you take each one of them and pass the certification exam, will qualify you for the Certified Software Test Lead CSTL certification. So, um, yeah.
We've got, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions, comments, issues. Anybody um, uh, please share uh, in the, the questions uh, uh, box. Uh, you know, any, anything that um, is not clear, anything you want to discuss further, any thoughts one way or another. And thank you all for attending. I hope that you're uh, finding this beneficial and can take advantage of it. Uh, Andy, are we yes. seeing any uh, no, questions? No questions out there. No okay, questions. Well, we'll give another minute or two. Uh, uh, so, Magdi, uh, you have any uh, questions or comments? Uh, as I'm listening to you, um, Robin, I've been thinking where do you think um, defect prevention fit in all this discussion? Uh, should I define my test process to be a defect prevention oriented or, or, or should, should um, team members have a defect prevention? I, I mean, you and I know that uh, finding defects, fixing them, um, and retesting again, it, it takes a time. So we try to tell people all the time that try to do things in a way such that by the time you come to test, you don't find as many defects as what you, as as much as you used to 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 see before. Um, and I'm just trying to, to I'm trying to understand from you should should defective prevention be a, 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 a something in our mind when we define our test process or not? Okay, so um, this is a topic that is near and dear to me because I I work in both requirements and QA testing. And I don't see them as all that unrelated, in fact, just the opposite. So when we look at where uh, defects originate, the great majority of defects originate with requirements that are wrong or overlooked. Okay. And there are many more requirements that are wrong and overlooked than most people realize, even after a project is done. They, you know, many people mistakenly believe that requirements change constantly. And while requirements can change, most of what are called requirements changes are not changes to the requirements. They're changes to the awareness of the requirements that have been there all along and could have and should have been identified. So indeed, you know, this is an area that I you know, have great concern and attention to. Uh, my book is how you get the requirements right in the first place. Two thirds of the book is how you discover what the real business requirements are. One third is how you review or evaluate whether those requirements are right. So in the um, in looking at the real process, uh, whoops, in looking at the real process, you said, well, QA is not active in reviewing requirements. Well, that's only part of the issue. The problem is that even when QA is active in reviewing requirements, there's a good chance that they're not doing a very good job of it. Okay. So uh, you know, we have a, we have a full day class called evaluating business requirements. Okay. Excuse me. So we have more than 21 ways to review requirements. Okay. Um, Remember, we have one one question from Kaylee we need to answer Good. before we end this. Good, and we'll pick that up in, in just a second. So the starting point is 
Effective testing, what I call proactive testing, includes applying our 21 plus ways of reviewing requirements, 15 plus ways of reviewing designs. Okay, and so what that does is that that turns the development process on its head so that the development process is now primarily doing things that create the right stuff rather than spending so much time doing wrong stuff and then hoping that we can catch it after it's been done wrong and then fix it, okay? And so when we get proactive in testing and software quality assurance, and those are different, but I'm not going to get into that right now, um, you know, we are doing things all the way down the line that help the development and testing process work together so that we are doing more right and less wrong at each point in the process. And that includes planning and designing tests, not test cases, but planning and designing the tests. Okay, you, you referred to scenarios, that's a variant. But when we do that, we're using our time much more productively so that the testing information is actually helping the development process do more right and less wrong. So long answer to a short question. And Kaylee had a, a question? Yes, yes. Uh, Kaylee's asking, any tips for how we can encourage all members of the team, not only just the QA, all members of the team, to speak up if they think that there is an issue with the process or even just how to recognize there is even an issue with the process? How to, Excellent. so the question is how Excellent. to encourage them. Excellent question. And so remember I used the term real process, okay? Um, let me just, point out here, and let me add in here, whoops, what did I just do? Where did it go? It goes into, uh, mm. oh, yeah. Okay, so people don't speak up, okay. So why don't they speak up? Oh, all kinds of reasons, if Robin, you know that. Don't care, management discourages, etc., etc., etc. So you need to understand why people don't speak up. Okay, but that's part of your real process. And so that's, that's another thing that we have to understand. Now, you can get a couple of hints, okay? Um, people don't see the value of QA and testing. Okay, and why don't they see the value? Because sometimes we're not providing the value that we think we're doing, okay? Yeah, so we need, we need to look in the mirror as well. Are we really providing the value that we think we're providing? Because if we're not, then we shouldn't be surprised if other people aren't buying into it. So we've got, we've got to look at ourselves first and not just say, well, these other people don't care about quality or whatever it is. So when we become a little bit more candid and have a better understanding of the real process, that's what gives us the basis for then more meaningful improvements, okay? And so we have to actually start delivering more value and then help the people see that we've delivered the value.
Does that um, does that help, Kaylee? Okay, we are five minutes beyond our time. Kaylee responded okay, well. positively. Uh, Robert, I want to thank you so much for sharing all this experience with us. I must admit, I've learned it myself. I learned a lot today from you, as always. Thank you for being willing to always come back and and share your experience with our audience. Thanks to everyone who attended today. Uh, as um, Robin mentioned, uh, we have those four courses that he put on the screen that are scheduled for the week of um, September 27, 28, 29, and 30. Uh, but we also have upcoming uh, free webinars almost every Thursday starting next, uh, next Thursday. Uh, you can look at the free webinars at the IIST website um, and hopefully we'll uh, meet you there. Again, thanks. This webinar is being uh, recorded and will be available at the IIST website early next week. Robin, again, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everybody.